<laughs> Hello, this is the Masked Bandit here with uh, the backup lecture to uh, European History for Tuesday, October 6th, 2020. <laughs> Where's the uh, season show? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Is the chart, has it reached you guys yet? Okay. When it's done, please stand up to it. Okay. Let's make sure it gets where it needs to go. Uh, so, if I were to ask you, I am going to ask you, uh, what is this country here? Three, two, one. Okay. It comes desultory, but it does come. Poland, Lithuania. Uh, have they gotten it already? Okay, so I'll take it back here. Thank you. Got it. Thanks. There are a couple of people who were absent, like Sam, but we'll get that and make it happen later. Russia. Holy Roman Empire. Denmark. Denmark. Sweden. Norway and Sweden, Scandinavia, basically. Okay. France. England. Wales. Scotland. Ireland. Aragon. Mediterranean, Adriatic, Tyrrhenian Sea, Liguorian Sea. Island. Sardinia, Corsica, Sicily. Whoever's doing it back there, you are making this sound so dull and boring. I love it. And Venetia, basically, is the whole area. Good. Okay. I'm sorry. In the spirit of that person. Good. <laughs> that was really well done. I, I, no, I, I, I am impressed. That degree of, 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 of boredom and, and disinterest is just amazing. Uh, oh, keep, keep it up, because that's not nothing. That's, that's, that is the product of real thought. Um, or a lack there. Okay. So as we have worked through these, by the way, if you haven't yet turned in your AP, uh, or not your AP, your 50 fact sheet, uh, you should do so. 
I am going to be giving you tomorrow, uh, I think, I hope, God willing, a new um, syllabus that moves us away from the A-B schedule back to a regular schedule. And what that will basically mean is that the Tuesday due dates will be moved to Monday because you're all going to be here on Monday, except for you folks at home. Um, there's no longer any need <clears throat> to give you a Tuesday due date. Also, I have been very reticent to give any late penalties because things have been so wacky. Um, I have given some limited penalties. I don't think I've given a single person the full minus 30. That's going to be changing um, probably as of next week. So if you don't have your 50 fact sheet until, until 3 o'clock today, there's no problem because we've been using the Tuesday 3 p.m. deadline. As of next week, due dates are Monday, and they are mostly in class, although I accept things up to 3 o'clock that day. Uh, and that, that will be the due date after that. Those of you who are in AP, um, we will continue to do things uh, from Friday to Friday, um, un un unless you hear otherwise. I think if there's any other change that I can see. Not that I can think of in here. Um, Okay, so we are back on the list of key individuals that I have given you. And again, I apologize for the, for the, the, uh, the lack of pizzazz in this presentation. This is, this is the closest I get to rote memorization of people, but it is simply because the Renaissance is about individuals, and it's censored in Italy. And since most of us are not Italian, the idea of asking you to, without going through some extra steps, remember almost two dozen largely Italian figures uh, just by name going rapid fire. Now, it seems like this is a good idea. So if you remember the things that, we, uh, that I emphasize, um, that's good. So to, re good. to review... Who is Marsilio Ficino? Take a look, raise hands, or... Yes, sir. Did he translate Plato? Uh-huh. Yep. So, Ficino translated Plato and Renaissance humanist philosopher. Okay. What about Uccello and Masaccio? Well, I'm not separating who in the quiz and tests probably be together. They were pretty good at the Yep, they were artists who helped develop linear perspective, which is a sense of getting, giving depth, uh, three-dimensional uh, impressions on a two-dimensional figure. What about Vittorino de Feltri? By the way, I will be honest, I have to look up de Feltri and Ficino uh, and a few of these others every year because they just go off. Yes. Uh, he was a humanist who taught at the school of Mantua. Mm -hmm. What was unusual about that school? Woodward. Oh, I'm Jesse. I'm sorry! Dan Masks. You're Miss Woodward. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I knew that was Sienna. I'm getting there. Okay. Yes, Jesse. Um, he let noble children attend the school with the common children, so everyone was there. Yeah, and that's really unusual in such a class conscious time. Uh, that was that was crazy out there, uh, utopian. Um, okay. Leonardo Bruni, uh, what did he do that stood out? Mr. Rick? He came up with the areas of history that we use. Yeah, and what was interesting about that, and this is something a lot of people don't pick up on, he didn't just decide this is the modern era, we'll go back to the Black Death. He decided this is the modern era right now. <laughs> right now we're entering a new age. And usually uh, it is very difficult to spot when we're entering a new age. I mean, the dinosaurs who experienced the destruction of the asteroid and the Deccan track or trap eruptions, they got a sense that it was a new age. The people who lived through Pearl Harbor, they had a sense that we were in a new period of time. But to get the sense that we're in a totally new age of history, that was a gutsy, gutsy prediction. And um, it, it, it panned out. It is a new age. Uh, he just he picked up on it first, and he was bold enough or reckless enough to argue, yep, today is totally different, uh, fundamentally different from everything that's happened in the past. 
Um, John Wycliffe, somebody over here. And what happened to him? Um, yep, as a heretic. So, why was the church unhappy about public criticism at this time? There was a reason. See him? After the Albigensian crusade, yeah. they were scared. Yeah, the, the fear was that if you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. So the church became very resistant to criticism, which, by the way, is a very bad idea. Um, if you're ever in charge of something, this is this is a hint. I've had uh, a few things in my life that I've been totally in charge of in the world of work. And the worst thing that you can do is make it difficult for people to come to you to complain. Now, you don't want them complaining on the work floor. You don't want them complaining in public in front of customers. You don't want them complaining in a way that is counterproductive. But if somebody has a grief, a uh, grievance, or if somebody sees a problem, the most good that they can do is to bring it to the boss and tell them about it. But so many leaders discourage that, either because their egos are brittle or because they just think, I'm in charge, therefore I'm always right. Nonsense. You're in charge, therefore you're responsible. So please, if you are, when you are, because all of you at some point uh, will be in charge of things and responsible for other people. It is wise to let people come and bring complaints to you, bring grievances and problems in a, in a certain way so that you can fix things. If you close your mind to that, if you make it clear that you don't want to hear it, you won't. And the problems will get worse and worse and worse until finally crisis of some kind is reached. Take it or leave it. That is that is that is one of my bits of leadership advice. And the church didn't, well, I wasn't around, but the church absolutely did not follow that because they were afraid of another Albigensian crusade. Um, and that made them brittle, and brittle things crack. Um, oh, let's see. Lorenzo il Magnifico de' Medici. Miss Vodnik. Um. And where did he rule? Can I just read it off of the... Well, you can, or you can just glance. Take a moment. It's not, it's not a speed test or anything. It's just important that, that uh, you all associate the city that he ruled. I'll give you a hint. It's also a woman's name. Italian statesman and ruler of the Florentine Republic. Florentine Republic. So, Florence. Uh, he is the ruler of Florence. Not that Siena is not a woman's name, but uh, Florence is usually the, considered the, the center of the Renaissance. Siena is close to the center, but isn't quite. Um, and finally, Johannes Gutenberg, Mr. Heaton. Uh, he was the inventor of the letter-by-letter -letter printing press in the Western world. What we call... Um, what we call, there it goes. Um, uh, it's not block printing, it's the opposite of block printing. Functional printing press, basically movable type. That's what it is, movable type. Um, and Gutenberg stands with Amerigo Vespucci as being uh, almost unique in human history, as having his name associated with something so gosh darn big. Amerigo Vespucci is the only person in human history who has not one, but two continents named after him. Did he discover them? No. But he mapped them, and he recognized them as a terra nova, as a new world. Therefore, we are not Colombians. We are not the United States of Colombia or USC. We are Americans, we, uh, named after Amerigo Vespucci. What kind of brass do you have to have? to put your name not on one continent, but on two. Uh, Gutenberg has a similar personal recognition because his development of movable type, his printing press, changes communication fundamentally. The Protestant Reformation is a product of the printing press, as you will see. The death of the memory of the medieval bards of mnemonics is a product of the printing press. The printing press allows for the storage of knowledge and information 
in a way that has never been done to that scale before. And that scale changes everything. Yeah, we've had writing since 5,000 years before Christ or longer, 7,000 years. But printing allows writing to become so commonplace that not only does every family eventually get to own its own Bible, but every family gets to own its own library if it wants. And that's amazing. And it's because of printing. So the human mind changes. The way we process information and communicate it changes. Human society changes. On a basic level, if you want to understand the difference, go to a Roman Catholic Mass. Heck, go to a Latin Roman Catholic Mass over at St. Joan of Arc. Not because necessarily you'll believe that that's the best way to worship, but respectfully to observe a traditional medieval Roman Catholic service, which is what it is in Latin. And then compare it to a Christian church service in a Presbyterian or a Congregationalist or a Methodist or a Wesleyan or some other Reformed Christian church, um, and you'll see massive difference. They're both Christian. They're both from the Western tradition. But the uh, medieval Latin service is rooted in a time when most people were not literate. Because in that time, most people would not get anywhere near anything like a book because they were so preciously rare. Um, the Reformed Christian churches in particular are products of printed Bibles, printed studies of the Bible, printed arguments about the Bible, and a bunch of other things that come from the era of print. And the way they use the knowledge, the way they process worship is very different. I guess I'm just trying to give you a sense of how different things were before the printing press. Now, if you want another sense, imagine things in the late 1800s and compare them to now, as we are developing electronic communications. So that's all review, and I went through a lot of it because there's a lot of information. Who is Petrarch? Uh, let's see. Ellie? Uh, he's an Italian scholar and poet. Um. The and the father of humanism is basically what you should remember. Petrarch is considered to be the father of humanism. This is like history by slogan, but it's a way of remembering. And remember, what is humanism? That's a question. We talked about it. I actually gave you a definition. What is humanism? Okay, fine. I'll, I'll, I'll relent on this one. Humanism is the belief that man is the measure of all things, and the proper study of man is man. The belief that man is the measure of all things, and that the proper study of man is man. So, if you live in, a, uh, in the Middle Ages, which is also known as Christendom in the West, and you're a top mind, and you'll go into theology, the, the figuring out what God is. If you are a person in the Renaissance or after, you will tend not to go into theology, although some do. You will tend to go into history or literature or some study of human beings, of human nature. That the proper study of man is man, and that man can be the measure of all things. In other words, how we react to reality is the important thing about reality. And it seems sort of speciesist, but um, compared to a theocentric view of life, uh, it is something that leads to modern society, to secular modern society. Uh, okay. I'm going to leave the Ninja Turtles till, till later because I'm going to be showing pictures. Uh, so, Isabella de Este. Isabella de Este. Mr. Uh, Arquesa, is that how you pronounce it? Arquesa. De Este, yeah. I'm sure real Italians would laugh at my pronunciation. Um, Arquesa of Manta, Manta, Mantua. Mantua. Uh, oh, you wanted Marchesa. Sorry, lost track. Yeah, Marchesa is basically Caucus. Okay. Okay. So Marchesa of Mantua, go on. 
Regents of Mantua during absence of husband, uh, Francesco II, uh, Gonzaga. Uh, Marques. Marques, uh, Mar Marques of Mantua. And the minority of her son, uh, for the Duke of Mantua. Okay. So Frederico gets actually promoted. This dude is more important than I count. Uh, Isabella de Este is a powerful Renaissance ru ruler who actually ruled. And uh, there are stories of her not actually working very hard uh, to get her husband back uh, because she liked ruling and she was good at it. Petticoat government. Throughout most of recorded history, Women do not have many opportunities to take real political power. However, there are exceptions. There are people like Queen Cleopatra VII, uh, who uh, wooed Caesar and Mark Antony and ruled Egypt, and she was certainly a powerful force. Um, Catherine the Great in more modern times in Russia, uh, the Empress Maria Theresa, who ruled Austria during the late 1700s. Um, Queen Zenobia of Palmyra, back in the crisis of the third century, who ruled a breakaway, you know, third or quarter of the old Roman Empire. Uh, but in general terms, women tend to exert power from behind the scenes. This does not mean that women have no power. Au contraire. What it means is that women wield power indirectly through their husbands, their sons, their fathers, um, through figureheads. If you know anything about Italian families or Chinese families, you will be familiar with the concept of the Dragon Lady. The Dragon Lady is Marie Barone in Everybody Loves Raymond, if you're familiar with that situation comedy. The Dragon Lady is the matriarch. She is the woman who is usually an older woman who's the mother or grandmother, and she has her fingers in everyone's life. And she gets what she wants, almost always. In Italy and in China, this is usually the way families are. Now, in China, it's made more complicated because traditionally in China, a wealthy husband can have more than one wife. But that doesn't mean that the dragon lady doesn't rule. She might be the, she's usually the first wife, but sometimes she's not. Sometimes she's the lowest of the wives, but she has the best relationship with her husband, and she rules through her husband. In fact, the term in Old Chinese, Taipan, is a reference to a warlord or a supreme commander. Do you know who the Tai Tai is? Supreme of the Supreme, his wife. So women have tended to rule indirectly, both within families and sometimes within societies. But it tends to be from behind the scenes. It's a rare woman who is allowed to and able to step out and rule in her own right. Uh, Isabella rules in nomine uh, in the name of her husband and of her son, but she's in charge for a long time. Another interesting woman, just from this period, is Catherine de' Medici, who was the Queen of France. Catherine de' Medici, who's a person I should have actually on the I, I thought I did put her on the list, but maybe I didn't, of the list of, of case study topics. She is the patron of the, of the, of the Seer Nostradamus. And she also rules or dominates several Valois kings uh, late uh, in, or during, the, during the early modern period. So, Isabella de Este, if you want to study a, a Renaissance ruler who happens to be female, she's the one. Okay, Nicola Machiavelli. Daisy. Uh, writer, among other things, the prince who advocated a ruthless, immoral, and subtle self-interest as the most rational basis for public policy. Excellent. Now, Machiavelli, we've read some from. What you need to know is that he wrote The Prince and that he has this reputation for just vicious pragmatism in rule. And it, it's not undeserved. He's advocating vicious pragmatism to the prince in that book. But Machiavelli is also quite an idealist. He writes a book called Republic, which is his dream of what society might be if we were going to follow the better angels of our nation. So Machiavelli had more complexity than just the author of vicious pragmatism in government. But that is has his significance. That's how he's known. So when you see Machiavelli, expect to talk about that. 
Uh, Queen Isabella of Castile. Yes. Uh, he, she was the ruler of Castile and he's married to the Spain. Yeah. And she conquered the Jews who expelled the Jews and some of the Right. Here's another case of a strong woman who rules. But why is she the dominant partner in that marriage? And God, she is. Uh, she's like Galadriel to Celeborn, if you're familiar with Tolkien. She is the Queen of Castile. Castile is much more powerful than Aragon. In her young ladyhood, she and her family had a choice. There was an eligible prince in Portugal and in Aragon. Had she chosen to marry the Portuguese prince, Spain would have been founded as a union of Castile and Portugal. It would have been more oriented towards the Atlantic Ocean. It would have had a different character. But she instead chose to marry Ferdinand of Aragon. And so Spain becomes a fusion of Aragon, Castile, and Navarre, and she conquers Granada. It's not that Ferdinand has no power. It's that Queen Isabella is the person who is the fulcrum in that court. She makes the final call because it was her kingdom of Castile that was the dominant partner when the country fused and came together. Um, that did not last. Uh, after her lifetime, um, Spain comes under the rule of the Habsburgs through marriage alliances. But amazing woman and at the fulcrum of several events, great and terrible. The expulsion of the Jews, horrific. The sending of Columbus, I think great, but a lot of people would disagree. And um, the expulsion of the Moors, the conclusion, the fulfillment of 700 years of reconquest. Uh, Ferdinand. Casey? Ruler of Aragon was married to United it was Castile from Spain. Conquered the Moors who expelled the Jews and sent Columbus on. Yeah, Ferdinand was uh, Isabella's junior partner. Uh, Pope Julius II. Uh, she both said something today, I think. That's great. Um, Mr. Cudmore. No, not Mr. Cudmore. I've lost it. Remind me. I think in Cold. Okay, I knew there was a C involved. Cold. Uh, okay, tell me about Pope Julius. Um, the warrior pontiff who defended papal territory against diverse secular rulers. Right. Pope Julius, what you should know is he's the warrior pope who was the patron of Michelangelo. Warrior pope who was the patron of Michelangelo. Later this week, we're going to see some extended excerpts from the movie The Agony and the Ecstasy, which is a dr dramatization of Michelangelo being forced to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, pretty much against his will for most of it. It's a, it's a wonderful movie. Uh, it was made the year I was born, 1965, and uh, Pope Julius is the second most important character in it, uh, next to Michelangelo, who's obviously the focal point. Uh, so, Warrior Pope, Mission Michelangelo. Pico de Mirandola. Take a volunteer. Yes, Jack. Italian Renaissance. Oh, just call it Renaissance. I, I am one of the rare people who in English say Renaissance, and again, it's an affectation. Just say Renaissance. That's, that's normal. Italian Renaissance philosopher who was famed for the events of 1486 when at the age of 23 he posted 10, 900 theses on religion, philosophy, natural philosophy, and magic against all comers, for which he wrote the famous Oration on the Dignity of Man. Been called the Manifesto of the Renaissance. So, what I would have you remember Pico di Mirandola, Oration on the Dignity of Man. And its significance is basically it is an affirmative statement about the individual and humanism in general. Uh, note that magic is included there because magic was considered to be one of the sciences. Uh, it's like alchemy. If any of you know what alchemy is from the Middle Ages, what is it? That's when you like try to make new stuff out of them. Yeah, in particular, do you remember what else? I mean, like potion stuff. Yeah, potion stuff. Yeah. It was like to 
a substance, like basically the big part of a substance that turns objects into either silver or Right. The, the most famous is the use of a philosopher's stone, which is the magic ingredient that takes lead and turns it into gold. Now, lead and gold are very similar. They have similar weights. They're similarly soft. But lead and gold are completely different in terms of our aesthetic appreciation. Also, gold's a lot more rare. So anyone who can turn lead to gold would be stinking rich. They'd also destroy the economy. But at first, they'd be stinking rich. So um, Harry Potter's first book in England, do any of you know what it was called? Yes, yeah. Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. And the Philosopher's Stone, right. Uh, because the assumption was in England, people knew what the heck the Philosopher's Stone was. When it came to America, it, it was the Sorcerer's Stone. Because you know, Americans, uh -huh. Philosopher's Stone, what? That's weird. Uh, so yeah, alchemy was the magic, but it's also the basis of modern chemistry. So uh, this sense of natural philosophy, which is what science was called then, is a mixture of what we would call superstition, magic, and actual science. So it's not a surprise that there was magic in there. Okay, Michelangelo again, Ninja Turtle will wait on him. Uh, Raphael also. Jan van Eyck. Uh, sir, Jan van Eyck. Uh, Flemish painter, active in and considered one of the best Northern European painters of the 15th century, who is often credited with inventing. Yeah, uh, Jan van Eyck, Northern painter, oil. Worked in oils. Uh, Jan Hus. Jan Hus is quite important. Yes, Ms. a religious dissident who was inspired by Hardy. Um, was the inspiration for a series of eponyms. Eponyms, that means named after him. Okay. John Wycliffe inspires the Lollard movement. Remember, Wycliffe is the English church reformer. Uh, the ideas really take off in what we now know as Bohemia and Moravia, the Czech Republic, right in the heart of Europe. Now, the Czech Republic is surrounded by German lands on almost all sides. Germans to the north, Germans to the west, Austrian Germans to the south, Slovak Slavs to the east. But the Czechs are a distinct group of Slavs. For whatever reason, the ideas of restructuring the church from a hierarchical monarchy into something far more democratic and similar to the early church spreads like wildfire throughout the Czech lands. And Jan Hus becomes the figurehead. How does Hus die? The same way Wycliffe does. He burns real good when you put enough oil and wood around it. But the Hussites do not take that line down. The Hussite wars are <clears throat> some of the most successful peasant rebellions in medieval history. Because what happens is, like the Albigensian Crusade, everyone who resents the current order, the monarchy, the papacy, everyone who feels that they are badly treated under this order, and there are a lot of people who are, joins the cause and suddenly you have an area in the heart of Europe that is burning out of control, like a wildfire, but it's a revolution. So like with the Albigensian Crusades, uh, the church and the state unify. They seal the area off, and, and, and again, like the Albigensian Crusade, they march in, and they wipe out the Hussites to the greatest extent possible. But if the church needed any more encouragement to be resistant to criticism, Jan Hus and what he does, what he leads to in, in the Czech lands, the Hussite Wars, it is enough to completely make them rigidly resistant to any outside criticism. The only criticism they might listen to is if you write in Latin, if you speak quietly to church leaders, and if you absolutely don't go publicly, which is the opposite of what Wycliffe and Hus do, which is why they're burned at the stake. Next page. Okay. Well, actually, what we're going to do is this. Those of you who are at home and on video, uh, I have on the Google Classroom a series of uh, images for you to search. And what I'd like you to do is go there and familiarize yourself with the image and also the context, content and critique. 
In other words, get a sense of who made the painting uh, or the building and what significance it has. And that's what you can work on for the rest of the period while I show these folks uh, some art history in here. Thank you.